Wrong that door. The thing about a one-shot film, mm. if you don't get it, you've got nothing. Service on table 20. I mean, how did you get on with frequencies and how did you cover all 34? It's probably going to... No! I mean, the main coffee. bit, really, was just to map it out in your head. Welcome to the latest Ursa exclusive, and we're here today with Kif McManus, who's very kindly joined us. Uh, it's a very special episode because Kif has worked on some of the most complicated shows uh, that I think you could imagine. So we're talking over 80 episodes of Top Gear, um, and then beyond that, it's shows like SAS, Who Dares Wins. So what was that? Working in like jungles? It was, it was a sort of, the first one, it was like a, a rig show, a classic rig show, like, yeah. you know, Big Brother. Yeah. But then suddenly they left the rig and, you know, could travel 15 kilometers through swamps or whatever else. And he was trying to figure out how to do that. Hugely complicated shows where you really don't know what's going to happen. It's kind of unscripted dramas. Um, and including in that, there was one Bear Grylls, the islands, mm -hmm. where they left 12 guys and 12 women on a deserted island to basically try and survive. And there were no, and you couldn't even go close to them. They were just filming themselves. So really, really complicated shows. But this episode is extra special because uh, there was a film that's recently come out on Netflix and it went in the theatres as well called Boiling Point. And it's a show which is one of the key features of the show is it starts and ends in one take. There are no cuts whatsoever. And it involves a, uh, a chef played by Stephen Graham who's going into work, travelling into work, talking to all the other chefs, and it's just like the day from hell, mm. right? <laughs> um, maybe how many speaking parts were there? 34, I think. Right, OK. So we're going to talk about Boiling Point and how it was that... I guess Kif can talk us a bit about the planning, the preparation, then the execution. We'll watch through some of the scenes and break down all the like the little nitty gritty bits of where the mics were and how hell they achieved some of these moments. So, shall we just play the the first yeah, intro? Sure. So we get a little in, get a little idea of how the show starts. So you got Stephen Graham walking into work. He does, has a little bit of dialogue on the phone, right? So this is walking down, was it Hackney High Street or Dawson High Street? Uh, I was just walking through Dawson Square. Right. Um, we actually we actually covered sort of a fair bit more of the walk, but mm. um, in the film, just to sort of give it the pace, they, they cut it sort of mm. quite close to the restaurant. So he leaves a message for his wife on the mm. phone. This is a continuous theme running through the movies, trying to get in touch with his son. But mm. So he, this quite, it was quite a long walk right at the beginning of the show, mm. right? He's walking down the street. And at the minute, he's wearing a, a hoodie or a, a pea it's coat? It's certainly like a big pea coat, mm. but it's done up to his neck, which the first time he popped it on, we just thought, oh, God. Because, yeah, because he's, right he's mic'd up in his chef's whites, and yeah. there's a, a mic hidden in that. As soon as he yeah. put the coat on, and you can see this collar's fully up. Oh, yeah, so right, yes, we can see um, it's really high. He's, it, it just sounded pants. So we thought, OK, we've got to get another mic. Okay. onto the coat. But the, our problem was we had so many mics out yeah. that we were running out of transmitters. So uh -huh. the transmitter in that coat, yeah. as soon as he gets into the restaurant and takes it off, as soon as the, sort of the cameras move away, yeah. I've got an assistant sneaking up to that coat to pull the mic out. Okay. Sort of go and then put it on another character who appears, you know, 10 minutes later or something. Oh, right. So, so how did you coordinate then between... So you, you had a trolley set up and then that for so how did how was it that you you managed to cover the the whole range because right now he's walking from like the outside area in through the front door but it's quite deep as you can see here as he walks in this is quite a large space to cover from from one position yes well i i, I split it up into essentially three sections mm -hmm. i had one section which um, included the outside area you just saw him walk through mm -hmm the restaurant area that you see him in now, the mm. bar, which is to our right, the second restaurant area, which is off yeah. to camera left at the moment, and his office and also some toilets. So that was my area. And then I had Rob Entwistle, mm -hmm. who co-mixed this with me. Rob covered the both kitchens mm -hmm. um, because it was just, when I read the script, it was, as, as I said, it was 34 speaking parts. It was just yeah. too big. I couldn't get my head around it. I thought I have to try and break it up into bits I can actually get my head. Also, yeah. physically, I can do. Mm -hmm. So 
I got, on my kitchen table, I went through the script with lots of little cards with all the actors' names, yeah. moving them around yeah. and seeing where everyone was. And, mm -hmm. and I sort of realised that the two kitchens was one bit I could isolate mm -hmm. as a, there was eight people who never left them. Right, OK. So that's eight off my plate. And there's four that move between that and the other areas. So I thought, OK, well, that's a 12 section. Mm -hmm. So that, and that's, I approached Rob because mm -hmm. I desperately needed him on something like this because he's has, on drama mixing, he's like far more experienced than me. And also I needed his cool head because uh -huh. he is super relaxed, calm character. Mm -hmm. And setting this up was yeah. not super relaxed and calm. So I really needed him to sort of anchor it. So Rob is actually, you can see behind him, in those, okay. there's a toilet in there, and Rob is parked in the toilet with his mixer. Right. So this to me, a kitchen, I'm just going to pause right here. This to me is one of the most stressful kind of environments for, for sound because you're in a real kitchen and we can see like stoves, we can see f the fridges and freezers and all sorts going on. What were the location challenges in, in this sort of live working restaurant that, that, that were getting in the way of getting clean audio? Well, when I went to have a look, yeah. you know, on the recce, and it was, it was, it was a working restaurant. Um, I thought, oh God, this is going to be, you know, that's making a noise, that's making a noise, that fan makes a noise. And I spoke to the owner and he said, you know, the, the fridges need to stay on because we need the lights. It needed to be... Mm. Right. To real. Right, yeah, you open a fridge. And also, yeah. it was a working restaurant, so yeah. you know, if, if things are chock full of expensive fish, you can't just go, oh, I'll just turn it off for the next sort of six hours. So we had to leave stuff on. The only real concession I could get is normally if they're sort of frying a lot of meat mm -hmm. on hot pans, mm -hmm. they'd have this super big extractor fan running. Oh, right. right. And that, that was the one concession I got. They could they turned that off. They still oh. had to have airflow, so it was, mm -hmm. it was on, but just at a trickle. Okay. But for the rest, it was just noise as was. Wow, okay. So you've got, I saw a picture, J Jody Campbell is your boom operator. So you had, I was thinking, oh, you can cover this with two booms and, but did it, was it just, was it covered with, with, with one wireless running boom? Yes. I mean, the reason, I had five assistants on it, mm -hmm. but the reason I chose one boom is, is that it's a one take thing. Mm. So, okay, you could get more coverage with more booms, but you could also get in shot with more booms. Yeah, and, yeah. That's, and that's the thing about a one-take thing. If, if at, at any point during the film, the yeah. camera pans and sees the boom op, yeah. or the boom, yeah. it's the end of the take. Yeah, totally. And then if that's an hour and a half in... Mm. Yeah. You need I mean, balls of steel. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So I thought, if I have one boom, yeah. but what I had to do with the boom... Um, I had a, a first and a key second, so Jody Campbell and Taz Fairbanks. So okay. they, they were brilliant together. So what they did is when we arrived on the the Wednesday, I think the actors started on the Monday of the week before mm -hmm. for costume, cooking lessons, things like mm -hmm. that. We moved in on the Wednesday and I immediately put uh, Jody and Taz with the camera department mm -hmm. to essentially start learning this dance. Because the camera yeah. department, they would run through the, the actors rehearsing, so they'd run through mm. the script from the beginning yeah. and the camera would rehearse with them. So both the camera knew where to go, but also the actors yeah. knew not to step backwards into the camera and right. things like that. Mm. And at the same time, I needed my assistants to learn where they could be. Mm. And Taz kept scrupulous notes mm -hmm. about exactly what the camera would do and where would be safe and where wouldn't be safe. Right. So during the actual take, um, I had them on a, um, a personal system. Uh -huh. So Taz was continuously just going through her notes going, okay, he's going to now walk up to the, to the kitchen area. Okay. He's going to sit on the outside of it. He's going to be panning, get yeah. on his left-hand side because he's mm -hmm. going to pan right, then move into the kitchen. And now run away and hide in the corridor because he's about to do yeah. a 360 swing around and show the entire restaurant. Right. Then he's going to move back into the restaurant. As soon as you see his back, get up behind him and get on his right-hand side because he's going to be panning left okay. down the restaurant. And it just went on like that page after page after page. Wow. Yeah. So, so she was hearing the instructions as, as a constant reminder of what, where the shot was going because the camera doesn't stop moving. No. It's fully handheld. Yes. Um, and 
that seem like, I mean, normally in like these kind of environments, you can see there's lots of open bulbs. And this is one thing where I was watching it thinking, how do you boom these tables and, and these scenes? Because you've got like an open bulb, you just, anything going o over or under one, you're going to be casting shadows on the left or the right. So well, how much did you actually manage to pick out, for example, these kind of modes? How much did you actually manage to get on the boom, really, like, or, or did it fill out what the radio mics were giving it, you? To, to, okay, some points yeah. the boom was was brilliant, mm -hmm. but a lot of the time you're using it just to add room to yeah. the to the thing because yeah. there's a lot going on in that, yeah. and especially if you've got a shot like this where um, where the um, commie chef is talking, he's really deep. You don't want him to stand yeah. up in your face. Mm. So, you know, you're using the boom to mm. give the post guys a bit of chance yeah. to pull back from it. I really like the way that the film always happened off screen as well. Like you would yeah. hear things happening in the restaurant, which then became part of the story. And I, I imagine that was stuff that was heard on the boom as well, just for the yeah. perspective of things slightly off also camera. Also made it a bit of a bitch to mix because yeah. you've only got, okay, neither Rob nor I had sight on any of this. I was boxed in beside the door yeah. and Rob was locked in the toilet. Yeah. So you couldn't see, all you, we had was the monitor, so the view of the camera, but a lot of the action starts behind the camera and then comes in. So, and also, it's not, this is not tightly scripted. Yeah. It's, they've got beat points, okay. but each take, you know, the actual dialogue was different. You know, it might run for a sentence, it might run for five. Right. So you're never really sure exactly when to pull someone down or to push mm. someone up, and especially if people are arriving from behind camera mm -hmm. okay you know they're going to arrive but you're not 100 percent sure when right so it, it makes it quite hard to mix care you know you've got to err on the side of i mean caution a bit yeah to, to uh, and i imagine getting a good mix is really important on the day because you've got ad's who are needing to cue things based on your mix as well yeah so and also the whole production you know the director that yeah. because again they had to sort of take a call pretty much instantaneous, mm. like, is this the scene? Or, yeah. And you know, to give actors points for the next take. Mm. Mm. You know, yeah. you're looking at an hour and a half yeah. play, really, and no one's ever seen it before. So they've really got to be able to see what's going on and hear exactly what they're going to get. And how was it possible? Because you explained that Rob Entwistle had four, he had 12 radio mics in his toilet mm -hmm. and you have 24 uh, I think Wizzycoms, is that right? Yeah, or channels actually. I, channels I didn't have 24 awesome. radio mics because oh, I, I, there was quite a lot of place mics stuck out as so, well. Uh, we have a picture of the trolley that you had set up. So it has two CL12s and two 688s. Yeah. So that's 24 channels. Yeah. And then Rob had a CL12 and a 688, so he covered the rest of the radio mics and the, yeah. the rest of the channels. Um, and how was it that you were able to send a, a full mix to one person? Because obviously you've got 12 channels that you... Were you getting a feedback from Rob as well in order to send out a mix that um, included his, his audio? Uh, yes, we had... Essentially, we had... Um, we rigged a... Or rather, Rob rigged a 633 yeah. um, closer to where production was. Right. They, were, they were literally mm. boarded behind yeah. a, a false wall. Uh -huh. And we fed both of our mixes into them, and oh. then that sent a sent a, yeah. a mix to okay. to production. That's cool. Now, one of the main things here is like good radio mic positions and aprons and these quite starchy white shirts. Mm. Sh I mean, are looking at this and all of the different ways that people wear them. Makes you sweat just looking well. at it, doesn't totally. it? Totally terrifying and the fact that they are quite often very physical mm. and they're moving around very physically so can you talk a little bit about how for example this scene in the kitchen mm -hmm. where you've got the inspector and the two sous chefs or the, the, the pastry chefs pastry chefs yes and then these two yeah. like would you run through a little bit of where where you managed to achieve okay, good the, placements on the chef's whites mm. we had white dpas right mm -hmm. So they, they blend in really nicely. And we ran them, there's a slit for a button here. Yeah. So we, we sort of fixed them, yeah. we, we fixed them quite heavily onto uh -huh. the back. I think I sent you a photo of them. Mm. So quite a lot of tape on the back to sort yeah. of hold the thing in place. Yeah. And then you just push it through just a tiny bit. So it's going through the buttonhole just like Yes. That. Okay. Because um, 
as you said, these are really starchy material. If you put it under it and it's rubbing on anything, yeah. you're going to hear it a lot. So you've, you know. Let me see if it, let me see if we can uh, pull out a little bit of a class shot. So was that the case with this costume, or was that on the apron? There were mics done on aprons. Mm. Um, like some of the aprons, the problem is people take them off and put them on again. Yeah. Especially the people like um, yeah. Stephen yeah. would wear an apron if he was in the kitchen, mm -hmm. inevitably, mm. but would take it off as soon as he left the kitchen, which actually we used to our advantage because mm -hmm. after we'd done a few rehearsals, we realised that Stephen is really soft-spoken. Mm -hmm. I mean, really, really soft-spoken. So we needed to turn the gain up a lot on his mic yeah. to, to pull that out of all the other noises. Mm -hmm. um, but there are points in it when he completely loses it yeah. and starts yelling. Yeah. And what this was doing, just because the gains were set so high on his mic, yeah. it was blowing that mic out. The feed was, you know, you'd think, well, it's useless now. Yeah. Kind of annoyingly, this often also happened in the back kitchen where it was impossible to get a boom in. Mm -hmm. Because for the rest of the restaurant, we managed to boom most of it, but the back kitchen, you could get a boom in, but you couldn't get it out again without being in shot because the camera would almost inevitably go into the kitchen, which had a tiny doorway and then a really narrow ingress and egress point. Yeah. He'd go in, come round, settle, but then inevitably come round to show the rest of the room and the door because that's where everyone exited from. So there was, you know, the boom could get in, but then nowhere to go yeah. and, and you couldn't back out of there in a, in a rush either okay. so we we just had to say the back kitchen we can't cover mm -hmm. with a boom which was a bit annoying because in the back kitchen a lot of stuff really loud shouty stuff happens yeah. Yeah. and there's a fight in there yes which you know as well yeah. as i do you know however well you mic someone as mm. soon as people have got hands on each other mm. it's a complete toss-up mm. if you've got anything or mm. not yeah so what we did is we rigged two CMITs up on the ceiling to give us reasonable coverage yeah. of the room, especially if voices were going up, yeah. and certainly enough to smooth over any right. things. And also, during the fight scene, there were a lot of people in there, mm. and all of them had open mics on. Mm -hmm. So even if one person mm. was like really yelling or had been grabbed, yeah. there'd be someone here with an open mic yeah. on yeah. that... You know, it give, at least gave Post had a, a decent chance of getting something out of that. So, so for, for Stephen Graham's character, when his his wire at this point, when he's wearing this apron, so, he so he's has, got two he has on. One, I'm sorry, I didn't finish. Yeah, sorry, yeah. he, he's got one on his whites, which yeah. is set to a low gain uh -huh. or a high gain, and then every time he goes into the kitchen, he puts on the apron, yeah. which has one stitched into. You see, the apron's folded mm. here. There's a, there's a TX stitched into that and then right. a microphone set on a, a really low gain. Uh -huh. And that's purely for him shouting. Right. Okay. That was something Taz the second, because she took these copious notes yeah. when we were saying, oh God, you know, what are we going to do about this? And he said, he only ever wears mm -hmm. the apron in the kitchen, but he always wears it. Mm -hmm. And he only ever shouts in the kitchen. So uh -huh. I think, and then she sorted out the mic in that. So, oh, it's, yeah. And Props to Taz. I saw a photo of the rigs on there, and it looked like a look. I think it was it us tape, little st strips of of black tape, and then I think it was something like, yeah, yeah, it would have been um, something sort of very discreet, basically. Cause yeah, I mean the, the 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 aprons weren't too hard. You just because they're they're reasonably thick material, yeah. so you just tape it up so it's just under the lip, yeah, behind. Yeah. Mm. So it's got the least chance of banging against anything. Yeah. And then you just make sure it's rigid. It's not. It can't get pulled because obviously they're moving about and yeah. carrying things like this. Yeah. So that's not terrible. It's just really where do you put the thing? And mm. the fact that they, and this is what it seems is normal in kitchens, you fold over the aprons a few times mm -hmm. to stop it being too long. Right. And that in that fold was cool. the, the perfect place yeah. to chuck a TX. Nice. So the show just. The show manages to cover such a large space. I wanted to ask quite how you were able to get full range when they go outside as well, because there's one moment where he's out, one of their characters is asked to go and get rid of the bins, and then, then he goes outside and it goes all the way back into like this back car park area. It's all you, you were filming all of this in the dead of night as well, so it's like 
and all sorts of lights casting shadows for any kind of booming in that mm. environment. Then he, then he gets into a car and has an exchange in a car. So how did you cover the sort of extremities of range? Yeah, what we what we did is for the the large footprint, mm. we could cover it, Rob and I. Mm. But there was a couple of points. One was the one you just mentioned, and yeah. the second one was the actually the three points when Stephen walks in for the first time, so he starts mm. his walk 200 metres away. Yeah. And th that's, you know, we didn't have security on the street. It's Dawson Square. There's a lot of mm. drunken people. You couldn't have aerials out there. Uh -huh. So we got um, a recordist called Nick Ollerinshaw, mm -hmm. who was outside with a bag, uh -huh. had um, a couple of receivers in the bag yeah. and a boom. Right. So for the first, the first thing you see in the film, mm him walking, leaving yeah. a message on the phone, all uh -huh. that street sound, that's all on Nick. Right. Okay. And then as he gets into the alley, that mm. then it comes over to me. Mm. Also, when we couldn't get a boom, we could possibly have covered the alley, mm. but I was concerned about getting in the car, if yeah. we'd then lose it, because yeah. wherever you put the mic, it's suddenly going underneath the level of, of mm. the dash, which has got an engine between you and any aerial. Mm -hmm. So I was concerned about that. So then the other thing is, when the camera comes out um, into the alley, mm. the cameraman actually steps onto a, a dolly right. and is then pushed uh -huh. by a grip okay. down there, so it's very smooth. Mm. And I could, we just couldn't get the boom op out mm. the door mm -hmm. in time to sort of, yeah. you know, not to sort of That's usually the case, isn't it, with doors? You have one boom op covering the one part of the door, and then when so they had, go under the door, you have another one taking them off. So I had yeah. Nick, who'd done the walk-in, yeah. he'd come round to the back of the restaurant, was hiding behind the door with the boom yeah. up like this. Yeah. So as soon as uh, the busboy came out, he was on him, yeah. and then got him round the corner and then dropped the boom down, because, again, he was going to walk up to mm. a car at night, mm. which, if you got a boom up, yeah. Guaranteed, you're going to be in the windscreen. Of yeah, totally. So, <laughs> you know, so he went then down feet. Yeah. To get all that walk up, okay. and then he was standing right next to the car yeah. for radio reception, so he could get mm. the two insides for the dog right, deal, okay. and then walked him back, and then again once as soon as he was back into the restaurant, back onto us again. Okay. And the so. final thing, when the ambulance pulled up. Yeah. I wasn't sure how much the ambulance guys were going to play. Mm. When I say guys, I mean yeah. Yeah. people, yeah. because it was. I think it was two women. Um, so he had mics on them and he was down when oh, they pulled up because I just wasn't sure if they were going to, yeah. you know, they weren't scripted to have much of a say in mm. anything, but yeah, the, the, if they, they start did. talking and there's no one there, you know, mm. if you haven't thought about it, then you're mm. in trouble. So he was doing that as well. So yeah. his, his part was small, but absolutely vital. I've I got to ask, how many takes did you do and were there any massive surprises that caught you out or caught everyone out or was there anything that happened on the day that didn't go to plan but still kind of worked out how did the whole we process did, of the rehearsing and, and we did on the friday we did a tech rehearsal mm -hmm. so basically just to make sure that all the you know everything's talking to everyone else so yeah. you know the producer can hear the mm. you know what yeah. i mean so yeah. it's basically just to make sure that everything is actually working yeah we had no serious or technical issues then we had to pull everything out because the, the restaurant was open on Friday and Saturday. Right. So we had to pull all the kit out, mm -hmm. walk it 500 metres up the street and load it into an old estate agent or something. <sighs> and then Monday we came back. Mm. Um, and Monday we did our first take. We, we started at four o'clock, so we wanted the, the, the sun to be oh, going down. Yeah. Um, we ran through it. I mean, it was... I mean, it wasn't a stinker, but it, it really wasn't good. Mm -hmm. Everyone was still trying to get their heads around it. And yeah. Yeah, it was just meh, I think, is the technical term <laughs> for a, a take like that. So then the, the cast got an hour and a half break to rest. Mm. We reset everything and then went for the second take. And that was a complete nightmare. Everything that could go wrong went wrong. Yeah. Technically, things would stop working. I think one of the cards in the cameras didn't record. But and I'm sure anyone who's ever mixed anything like, yeah. well, anything, some takes you just can't seem to get in front of the ball. You're always mm -hmm. a bit behind it. Yeah. And that take was like that the whole time, but it went on for an hour and a half and you were just 
struggling the whole time, thinking, oh my God, oh, he's coming early. Where's his, well, there he is, yeah. up we go. Yeah. And it was, it was like a car crash that you just couldn't get out of for an hour and a half. It was hideous. I honestly, at the end of it, I just thought, you know, why did I take this on? And then we broke for the night and then it became sort of word on the grapevine was COVID was rampant then. And so we were this heading, was March 2020? Yes, and it was right. late March 2020. Oh gosh, yeah. So this Boris so, is on the TV every day yeah, saying... Like, saying if you feel ill, stay at home, right. protect yourself and the family. And um, Okay, this was on the Monday. Yeah. We actually went into national lockdown on the Friday, but everyone was waiting for the, like, the hammer to drop at any point. Wow. And also people were scared. We had 120 people in that restaurant. Mm -hmm. And the production was actually struggling to keep them there because mm -hmm. a lot of people were saying, I don't think it's, I shouldn't be doing this. And yeah. so it, on the Monday night, after that stinky, stinky take, it sort of, word of the great run was, we might just have tomorrow. And then, because originally we'd planned for two takes Monday, two takes Tuesday, two mm -hmm. takes Wednesday, two takes Thursday. And then if we needed it, two takes on Friday. Right. But now it looked like we had two more goes at this and that was it. And if, and also the thing about a one-shot film, mm. if you don't get it, you've got nothing. Yeah. Like a normal film, okay, look, we have to stop now, but we've already got yeah. the first half. Yeah. So we just come back and do that. There were no scene moments or anything. No, there were no, nothing. No, I mean, like, the whole point of a one yeah, take is yeah. either you've got it or you yeah. really have nothing. Mm -hmm. So, you know, if you had gone down then, that was it. It would never yeah. happen again. And also, this is quite a low-budget production as well. Yeah. So the idea of painting things out was probably beyond what they would want to be able to do in some I think some the ways. entire budget for the thing was yeah. 530 grand. Wow. Yeah, I mean, that's micro, yeah. micro budget. Did that affect your choice for equipment? Yes. Well, yes. <laughs> I think that... I mean, normally you'd... you'd, you'd equip this by looking at what they need uh -huh. and then spec it out to that mm -hmm. whereas because of the budget we had to yeah. go well what have we got yeah yeah and what can we add to that to make this so hence i had two cl12s and two 668s yeah yeah and rob had a 68 and a cl yeah. because we had them mm. yeah you know yeah. and you know we used WYSIWYGs. well i probably would have used WYSIWYGs anyway but yeah. we had we had WYSIWYGs. we yeah. had I think I rented, in, I rented a CL12, a 668, yeah. a four zone aerial combiner. Uh huh. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, another A10 rack and a few extra whizzy guys. Right, okay. But the rest we sort of, it was a question yeah. of what have you got in your shed and I'll bring whatever <laughs> I've got in my shed. So it was, it was, it was what we could use. Mm -hmm. But I mean, I mean, it makes you think, doesn't it? So 530 grand for a film like that. that. I'm not saying you should make films for that little money, mm -hmm. but it just shows what's possible if you mm -hmm. mm. if you try very hard yeah. and you're, you yeah. think about it. You can do stuff. Mm. I'm, I'm not suggesting you do do it like that, but you can do it. And, was, and as it was low budget, was there a real tight collaboration within, within the departments? Did you feel like this was quite like a, a show where you had... Were you able to collaborate with the camera and costume to sort of help make this possible? Were there some things there? Yes. Everyone was, without fail, lovely to each other. Because mm -hmm. we all knew this was a, a bit of a big leap. Uh -huh. We were all doing it probably against... I mean, there were, there were two... When I was initially approached with this, mm -hmm. um, the a producer I'd worked with a couple of times before said... I'd like you to have a look at this because of your sort of work on the unscripted stuff and yeah. talking and things. Mm -hmm. And I, I'd like you to collaborate with these two other recordists mm -hmm. again, yeah. you know, because of their reps. And I, and I looked and I thought, mm, interesting. So I got in touch with them and mm -hmm. it became obvious they didn't want to touch it with a big stick. <laughs> right. Because, I mean, the possibility for it to blow up in your face was just yeah. enormous. Yeah. You know, you could look really, really bad. Mm -hmm. Um. So they, they went, <laughs> oh, not me, thank you. <laughs> so, so everyone who committed to it yeah. was taking a big risk. And, mm -hmm. uh, and I think everyone that helped. And mm -hmm. also, they were just a friendly lot. Mm -hmm. I mean, yeah. I meet a lot of friendly people on sets, to tell the truth. You know, if, if yeah. you treat them in a nice way, they, mm. they're often quite lovely people. 
And what and what advice would you give to someone wanting to get into sound? What what kind of personality? What kind of person are you looking for in in your department for for, for, for maybe for, particularly for a job like this? What 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 really were you Different looking sorts, for? Really? Yeah. Okay. I chose Jody. Uh huh. Um. I've worked with her before. She's an excellent boom op, and she's really friendly, mm. and also gets on with people very well. Mm. So I knew we were going to have to work properly hand in glove with the camera department. Mm. So I wanted someone who camera department would get on with and yeah. would work with. Yeah. So Jody, and this is a really useful thing. Jody, if a cameraman sort of pans up and gets her in shot, yeah. and goes, oh, boom in shot, she'll go, oh, I'm so sorry, did I ruin your shot? Which means the cameraman will then say, oh, no, actually, I, I panned a bit wildly. In fact, I'll try and do better. So mm -hmm. suddenly you've got both people trying better rather than one pissed off at the other. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, because how that often goes, and I've heard, yeah. I've just got on the line that you told me to. Yeah. You know, and then that, then it doesn't go well. Mm. So that's the reason I chose mm. Jodie. Mm -hmm. Taz is fiercely organised. There's a picture of there of her mic organisation the table. on the table. Yeah, area. the table with everything laid out. You yeah. know, she did all the notes, you mm. know, so she could prompt Jodie through mm. it. Um, she was the one who noticed that mm. he only shouts in the kitchen and he wears. Yeah. So fiercely Organisation is, is super key yeah, okay. in, in this. Yeah. Well, in sound, it's, it's super key, I think. Mm -hmm. You have to know all the bits, where all the bits are, and you have to put all the bits yeah. where they should go well, every time. Yeah. So the, I'd say getting on with people is a huge one. Mm. Organisation, another huge one. Common sense, which is a bit of a misnomer because I've not found it terribly common at all. Uh -huh. But really, if you can generate common sense mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. more than anything mm -hmm. and, and, and a, i suppose an, a willingness to work so it is quite hard work i mean this mm -hmm. was a you know it was hard work it really was mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but tremendously rewarding you know yeah. once we'd actually finished once they came yeah. out after the um well what happened is after, I'm sorry, I, Carry on I we kind of jumped all over the place. No, I know, but this, I think, I think this, the, is a difficult, this is a difficult show yeah. to talk about because it is one complicated yeah. setup. So when we came back on the Tuesday, which was mm. everyone sort of kind of got was going to be our last day, we yeah. set up and again, four o'clock we took off and it just went perfectly. Uh -huh. It was, you know, the sound was spot on, the mm. actors brilliant, the camera at work superb, everything just went well. Mm. So we finished it and thought, oh, well, perhaps it is possible. Yeah. <laughs> oh. And then um, again, we went for a, another take, so that mm. was take number four. Mm. Had a, the actors had an hour and a half rest, we had some food, set off again, mm. and again, technically a perfect take. Wow. Um, but the actors, I think, because they're a bit tired, mm. weren't as happy with their yeah. performances. So after the end of the fourth take, the producer and director came out and said, uh, thank you very much, everyone. I think we've got a movie. And that's it. And it was, everyone just like, I can't believe we just did that. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Yeah, it took a while to sink in, but yes. A few glasses of wine were drunk that night, I can tell you. Amazing. Um, what do you, what would you take away from it then? Would you do would you do something like this again? How if you went get about this again, have, what would you would you do anything differently, or what have you learnt from this experience? Um, I'm not sure. Okay, there's a few technical things I'd probably do slightly differently, but n no, I, I think I think the the reason this worked. Was, mm -hmm. It was collaboration. It wasn't yeah. me trying to do it. Uh -huh. I pulled in people I needed to help me. So mm -hmm. Rob, I could not have mm -hmm. done it without him, and Nick. Yeah. I needed those two people. I couldn't do it all by myself, yeah. or at least not well. Mm -hmm. But but it's by saying, okay, I can do this bit, but I really need help with that bit. Mm -hmm. It's like a normal film. You know, you've got a first unit, you've got a second unit, you've yeah. got... Yeah. You do need those things, and you and I think you've got to... Once you accept that yeah. and go, okay, I can't do it all myself, mm. and there's some skills I need here mm. that I don't have, so I need to pull mm. them in. I think you're golden mm. then after that. 
I just want to ask quickly, um, can you tell me about the microphone choices you used for this show? Because you said that you had cements hanging in that in that uh, in the back kitchen because you yes. couldn't get a boom in there, yes. and that covered you for the for the shouts. What was Jody? What was the boom that Jody was Jody using? Jody was on a um, fifty. Okay, MKH fifty. Is that your uh, normal sort of go to microphone for indoors? Yeah, yeah, I like it. Mm. Um, I, it's it's nice and short. It's, yeah. it's it's back pattern is tiny, mm. so you don't get a lot of echo and stuff yeah. like that. And I just like the sound of it. But that's yeah. a terribly personal thing. I think you could, you know, choose a dozen recorders and they probably mm. have a do dozen mm. different things. But I personally like the sound of a mm. fifty. The reason we used the uh, cmits in the back room yeah. is they were pretty high up, okay, yeah. and I wanted something as clean as possible, mm -hmm. just because there was going to be an awful lot of mm. stuff mm. going on in there. And then the cast were DPAs, is that? They were all DPAs, DPAs um, yeah. all 61s, 4061s. Are they the red dot ones with the slightly yeah, they're, they're 10 dB they're, pad? They're, yes, right? exactly. Yeah. I, I just found the 60s, okay, if it's for a chat, 60s are lovely, mm -hmm. but the 61s just give you that bit more range if things mm -hmm. get a bit hot. Yeah. And sometimes, and who knew? Yeah, there was massive <laughs> level yeah, changes. Was, yeah, exactly. Yeah. There was lots of opportunity mm. for that so i'm mm. personally mm. i always use 60 ones mm. for myself so i don't find i don't find i'm missing anything mm. but i just get that extra bit of room to and i'm sure some people are thinking 34 radios how did you possibly find enough frequencies to go around for 34 in central london where you've got some complications with rogue i mean how did you get on with frequencies and how did you cover all 34 we were, well i okay I, the, the thing to do with that yeah. is you go straight to ofcom Right. And you say, I need this. I've got the, this equipment, so mm -hmm. I can go from here to here. Mm. Can you give me... And they will work out a frequency plan for you at... Right. Well, OK, apart from paying for the licence, at no cost. Mm -hmm. So I had, I think, 36 frequencies that they... We licensed them, obviously, mm -hmm. that they sent me, but they did the frequency plan for me, right, okay. which is a lot better than trying to do that on uh -huh. Freak Finder or something. Yeah, yeah. Because the thing is, okay, if you're using that many frequencies, you need a license. Mm -hmm. You know, it's a big production. You, yeah. You've got to play by the rules. Mm. Then let Ofcom help, because they do help, really oh. do help. And what was your spread? It's like 500? It was, it was, I think, 560 up to 630, 640 around oh. there. Yeah. I mean, nothing in the unlicensed range. Mm -hmm. So nothing from 606 to 613 mm -hmm. because I couldn't guarantee that yeah, someone else well wasn't going to be on them. Exactly. I, okay, so that, so you avoided the traditional sort of frequency band that another show could just have um, quite easily yeah. without having to ask Ofcom. Yes, exactly. So you went right. into a clear band and, and got those. Yes. The, and that's the benefit of Wizzy, it's quite broadband, right? Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. That, that's yeah. one of the reasons. But you mentioned also that you had some Saxcom units as well. Yes, to try and free up, because there were just so many radio channels yeah. that we needed. And we only had, I mean, just physically with the mixers and the, yeah. and the control surfaces, yeah. only had so many places you could plug them in. Yeah. So I thought, I've, I need some plant mics around mm. the place to, to, yeah. you know, just to make this sort of sound mm. not like a, a radio mic show. Yeah. So I, there were six characters that I deemed, and this is, purely off my own bat, I have to say, I didn't ask anybody, but through reading through the scripts, a lot of times, there were six characters that had only a few lines, mm. and, and actually, the, the whole point of them was more to bring out the character of a more right. central cast member. Yeah, yeah. So I thought, okay, these six I'm gonna put on Zaxcom recorders. Right, so not that, transmitting, right? Just Not transmitting, just recording, because I didn't want extra transmitting anyway mm. in, yeah. you know, I, I, the, the fewer sort of, radio signals generating mm. in that restaurant, the better. Yeah. I already had a lot. No, just purely recorders. Yeah. So time code those at the beginning of the evening, put them on them. Mm -hmm. The boom was always there or thereabouts yeah. with those characters, because mm -hmm. another mm -hmm. reason why I chose them. Yeah. But, so they went on Zach's right, okay. So it's just a question of harvesting the cars at the end of the evening, yeah, giving them the dinner. So they were like, oh, do you, the They were the four are... American girls. Right, okay, that big table. That big yeah. table. And, and again, I wasn't too concerned about them because that was boom territory. Mm -hmm. There wasn't any really bad lights there. Mm. They were sitting really close together. Mm. So if one of them had died, 
Yeah. It will, I would have got it on the other one. Yeah. yeah. And the wine waiter, mm -hmm. uh, the the Scotsman, wasn't he? So the okay. Yeah. Yeah. Was proper oh, he was, he on, was on a proper, and he was close yes, to them. Yes, yeah, exactly. Yeah, so right. I thought, yeah, I'm going to be fine. Yeah with that you know whatever happens uh -huh. you know even if i have a bit of bad luck and one or two break still mm -hmm. i'm gonna be good and the other two were the the social influencers there was a main social influence he was on a radio because yeah. i needed he actually he needed to cue things off or, yeah, yeah exactly other people uh, would need to hear his mic as yeah. well um yeah. but the other two his two mates yeah like had like a line each it was yeah. like Cool, yeah, or you know, right, yeah, yeah. You know, so, so I just thought, mm, you know, yeah, what? Cool. <laughs> yeah, it makes sense. So there's a lot of real, a lot of. I mean, this was all stuff you organised well in advance of the mm. shoot. So how long did you need to get yourself organised for this show? Did 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 it, how did the prep time sort of work out? Because it sounds like the shoot itself was actually quite short. Maybe you were prepping for prepping for longer than you were shooting. It was. I, I mean, the main bit really was just trying to. You know, to to map it out in your head, mm. and I, I don't know about you, but I I find that's the main bit of of yeah. our work generally. Yeah. It's sort of the time you spend just sitting there thinking, literally going through it step by step in your head, mm -hmm. and perhaps making you know, oh, don't forget to bring that or yeah, that is possibly the most useful thing. Once you've done that and you've got it really clear in your head, mm. then everything else is just a question of assembling. You know, we all know where that plug goes. You know, it, yeah. it, you know, I know what I'm going to do. It's just putting it together now. Yeah. So the thinky bit and the planny bit did yeah. take a while. It was a lot of, you know, that yeah. sort of thing. You know, looking at these endless things. But how, you know, okay, how yeah. can I do this? And I've still got too many. And then you think, you know, like at one stage I had, I still had 24 characters that I had to have, which gave me a no way to link the two mixes together. And B, that meant no plant mics at all, or yeah. And where's the boom going to go? You know, so you just think, okay, we've got to. So that's when I sort of thought, okay, ZFR is on. We just have yeah. to look who's yeah. who's not that important. Mm. Who can I get to mm. for sure on the boom? So those six go. Okay, now I've got six channels to mm. play with. Yeah. Right. You know, now I've got a bit of wiggle room. So and it's just that it's just going through it in your head. The actual, um, I rang. I think it was actually audio. I did. I rang the audio department and said, look, I'm doing this. I need some bits and bobs. Mm -hmm. Any advice you give me? Because mm -hmm. they were the ones who said, I think you need a four zone antenna. Oh, OK. Yeah. So, so do you have antennas in two places exactly. in one location? Because it was, mm. I mean, perhaps we could have got away with it, mm. but I'm not sure. And you really well, don't you want to You were out front and back simultaneously. Yes. I mean, you yeah. just have to move your aerials back and forth. If yes, you didn't exactly. Do that, right? No, yeah. no, no. Yeah. So that was a really good suggestion yeah. on their part. That wouldn't have immediately leapt into my head. Yeah. But they said, mm, I think you might need that. Yeah. I'm going to give you the A10 rack and the, yeah. you know, the 688 and the CL6, CL12 mm. rather. So I, I hired a bunch of gear from here and also some extra mics. Mm. Um, yeah. But then it was just great. Well, we got there on the Wednesday and just, I mean, there's a picture of me sort of going, <laughs> as we were trying to put it all together. Thinking, you know, actually, where does this? Where can I put this on my? You know, the two. Yeah, the two, the two yeah. desks mixing <laughs> yeah, like yeah. this, and, and, and trying to see behind you, one of them to see if you're recording. Honestly, I don't know how you held it. How how you got? How you were able to to coordinate this all into one coherent thing that was because it was so important that it just worked and combined together. Yeah, well, that's why. I mean, in first and, and the second take, it really didn't. <laughs> And I, my worry was that I can't, <laughs> I can't coordinate it in one current well, thing. But then, practice did, makes perfect, did, as they say. And it, I'm like, I was watching it enthralled, and it's a, such a, it's a very stressful film to watch, <laughs> because you are caught up in this whirlwind of a nightmare of a day, yeah. where everything that possibly could go wrong so it feels like it does, and by the end, you're exhausted. Mm. It's a real, like experience yeah. and um i had honestly i had to pause it and walk away a few times just because it was getting a bit much it's very it's very stressful but it's brilliantly put together beautiful piece of filmmaking and actually it makes you know i know one shot thing is it's a bit of a conceit but it actually i think it, it sort of works with this because it, it just 
drags you along. I mean, whether you like it or not, it depends if you like a tense movie. Yeah. But it sure as hell drags you it, into and, that and movie, you do, doesn't it? You don't, you're not drawn to the fact that this is a one-shot movie no, either. It no. doesn't... It there are no it, tricks. It's not yeah. like... Um, was it Birdman? Yeah. Which is sort of continuously saying... You're asking yourself, saying, when was the join? Because yeah. that's impossible. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I find things like that a little take you a little bit away from, away from the And show. exactly the same with 1917. Yes, you, you saw It was brilliant. Yourself. I mean, in every respect. But as... Because I work in the industry. Yeah. I'd suddenly find myself out of the story going, yeah. how did how they, they do, do that? that? <laughs> you know, which kind of ruins it a bit yeah. for you, doesn't it? Yeah. So this was just, just about, like... It didn't. T it didn't show off too much. It was a very kind of conservatively placed film, which didn't try to do or show it show off too much. But it just showed great performances, yeah. and uh, and they were captured so nicely, and it felt so real and genuine in in the in the environment, the perspective of the sound. It all sort of fitted together into one thing. Um, I don't know what else to say. Thank you very much for t giving us some great My pleasure, insight. Buddy. My pleasure. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, really appreciate that. And we're going to be with Kif again for another quick video where we're going to go through some of his other work on the more kind of completely unscripted shows mm -hmm. where we'll talk a bit about the Top Gear episodes, some of the specials from the Grand Tour and possibly also a bit about Bear Grylls because this is, again, very complicated, logistically a bit of uh, curveballs thrown at you all the time, I imagine, mm. and environmental things. At least with this, you weren't dealing with too much wind and rain no, and the no, elements. No, none of you those, were, luckily. You were, you were, this is a, the, next, the next thing with Kiff, is we're going to really dive into how to deal with incredibly complicated environmental times, motorcycling through um, Vietnam mm. and, um, and dealing with people who get completely soaked top to tail. Yeah. Um, so please join us for that. And again, thank you very much, Kiss. It's a pleasure, buddy. Cool.